It's been a fantastic uh, two or three days. My only regret is that I did not give myself the opportunity to talk with more of you personally, one-on-one. Um, it's a very diver- incredibly diverse crowd uh, here from all over the world and all kinds of industries and different types of work within those industries. Um, actually, how many of you were with us on Wednesday? Doing, we had a couple of workshops on Wednesday. I'm wondering how many people, quite a few of the people who were here on Wednesday have, have, have remained with us. Um, it's, it's been a, a full of a lot of learning, I must say, I think for myself and I uh, hope for you as well. Does anyone need to stand up for a moment? If you would like to do so, please do get the blood circulating again. Um, we can talk just as well standing up uh, as we can with you sitting down. Uh, I know it's hard to sit down. I have a hard time just sitting down too long. So, um, but in spite of the fact that Dan encouraged me to take as much time as I need, I, I, I will try to uh, ship on time. So uh, I'll get started. Um, Dan asked me to talk about deepening the fundamentals uh, embedding the practice of, of the practice of lean, so that's uh, quite a uh, quite a task. I guess before we can uh, embed any kind of practice, um, we'd have to determine what what is lean, and I suppose that, that we should uh, be consensed on that by now. Uh, we've been together, many of us, for three days, the rest of us for two days, and we've all been working in uh, with uh, lean thinking in one form or another for for many of us for a very long time. Um, but you know, if we have a couple of hundred people in the room, I imagine we have close to a couple hundred different views of exactly what lean is. So it's always worth, I think, taking a look. And before we can deepen the fundamental fundamentals, we certainly need to, I think, have some idea of what those fundamentals are. And again, time is short, so I'm going to just show a couple of things. I'm going to have to rely on the help of my friend in the back. Uh, to start this uh, brief video. Some of you may have seen this before. How many of you have seen this before, just from looking at it? A, 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 fairly, a fair number of you have. But there are a couple of points I want to make. So can we start that video now, if you're hearing me in the back? There we go. So the narration is simply telling uh, how to go about doing some standard work, which is to reach across the middle, to go three quarters up, to fold over. Then grab both sides and voila. All done was the last thing she said, right, Takeshi? Um, my shirts always look that way when I fold them. <laughs> and one reason I like to show that is simply that this kind of thing is the image a lot of people have of lean, which is being very efficient. I mean, she did a great job. Very, it was very f- much faster than I do when I fold my T-shirts and much better. I mean, what could be more lean, right? Of course, that's basically just good old-fashioned industrial engineering uh, that's been around for a long time, I think, that enabled uh, her to do that. Um, here's another uh, YouTube video. You can find this one as well. This one is not Japanese but Chinese. So uh, I don't know if there's someone who can help uh, translate uh, this one, but I think we can tell what's going on. Um, so can we start this video as well? So this is a train. As Dan was just explaining, end-to-end is one of the things we want to achieve in Lean. Yes? Value from the customer's perspective. We don't like waste, right? A waste of waiting, and it's, especially certainly the customer. I mean, when I get on the train to go from uh, Boston to New York, I don't need to stop in Hart, you know, all the New Haven and all those places. So what you just saw were patients getting, uh, excuse me, not patients, <laughs> not yet anyway, um, passengers getting on a pod, and look at that, the train didn't even have to stop, the train didn't have to stop, no waste, no waiting, I didn't, doesn't do the passenger any good to have to stop at every stop, yeah, and it dropped off another pod, and what's happening here is, look at that, passengers getting out. So the people who need to get out uh, at New Haven can get out, and those of us who didn't can just continue on to New York City. So the only point I'm trying to make here is, you know what, that's lean too. So those little mundane, going really detailed into the work so you can fold the t-shirt well and do all the work, you know, just, just exactly right and efficiently is lean. But thinking next level, thinking of what's coming next, thinking out of the box, 
Uh, that's also lean. But a lot of people don't think of it that way, right? They think, well, that's not lean, right? Well, I think that's lean. And for sure, regardless of what you may be thinking of lean is, I think for sure this is lean, which is solving problems as close as possible to where they occur in both time and space. And so what you see here is a look at uh, solving the problems where you, hear, you see some very happy engineers, probably, problem solvers, expert solvers here in a room, uh, looking at the data, and they have a bunch of their very sophisticated problem analysis tools, and they have some data up on the, up on the whiteboard here, and they're very happy. They're talking <laughs> about the problems. <laughs> and meanwhile, outside here at the Gimba, you have some poor worker. You, know, you have this, this assembly line here, and the worker with the, 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 the exclamation point, who's very upset because he's encountered, he or she has encountered a defect. And of course, what we want is to be out there at the point where the defect is occurring so we can respond to it right now, not after the fact. So the further, we get, further away we get from the problem in either time or space, the harder it is to find the root cause, right? If it's a day later, or a week later, or a month later, then you need all those very sophisticated problem analysis tools to help you dive into it. And sometimes we need that, yes. But if I can be right there, right now, when the problem occurs... Okay, well, the trail is still hot, the trail is still warm, then uh, maybe I can do something about it right away. So for sure, uh, when I think of what lean is, uh, it's definitely this. I think it's those other two things as well, but it's definitely this. Now, this is an old, speaking of fundamentals, which uh, Dan asked me to talk about, this is an old graphic uh, from a book called Gemba Kaizen by a man named uh, Imai. Uh, I think this book was from about 1986, so one of the early books about lean. And I think it's kind of a nice little graphic. And by the way, a new edition of this is coming out soon, by the way. And what you see is over here on this axis, you see uh, from the bottom, value-creating workers, uh, frontline supervision, middle management, senior executives. And then you see this, this uh, diagonal uh, division that's been, that's been uh, drawn, where you see down here uh, a lot of emphasis of everyone, then, on maintenance. Maintenance. There's a Japanese word for that that he used. And then in the middle uh, here, we have Kaizen. And that's certainly, when we think of lean, that's absolutely what uh, lean is about, is doing Kaizen. Well, what is Kaizen? And then up there at the top, you have innovation, or Kaikaku. And lean is, in the point that I want to leave here in terms of a fundamental understanding, is lean is all of these. It's radical innovation, as well as it's making improvements, and it absolutely is solving problems. Problems as they come up to us, it's dealing with those. So here's some additional definition around this. So I added this. I hope Mr. Imai doesn't mind. Um, but maintenance, or the Japanese word iji, is something we apply especially to routine work. And that means solving problems to reach baseline desired performance. So I know I need to be able to produce 100 units per day. I need to be able to do 100 inoculations per hour. Uh, I need to be able to close so many sales per week. I need to be able to, produce, uh, to complete this project within nine months. Okay? That's desired base level performance. And then Kaizen is somehow making that situation better. That's solving problems and removing barriers to raise performance to new levels. So that's what the lady with the t-shirt was doing. I think when she started out, she probably made a mess out of her t-shirts the way I do. <laughs> it took her about a minute to do it instead of uh, as quickly as she did it, right? So uh, we're solving problems. Here we're raising the performance to new levels. And we absolutely want to do this and, and with our lean thinking. But over here, innovation, Kayakoko, that's bold new initiatives. That's working in new ways to achieve new aims. So uh, I think a lot of what Dan was talking about there at the end was working in new ways to achieve new aims. And I think that's what that train, the Chinese train example was all about as well, how to get true end-to-end -end value for the customer. And I, I like to show this lately. I'm kind of looking at this graphic a lot for the first time in, in probably in 20 years. <laughs> um, you know, and I wonder if the lines are so really so clearly drawn. I mean, the way Mr. Imai drew it in the old days, see the, the solid line there between them, and I've kind of made that a dotted line. Because my hypothesis is that the better we get at this, the skills, the, 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 the nerves and the muscles okay, that we, we develop from our day-to-day -day problem solving enable us to more effectively do Kaizen, raising the, the, the levels to new, new performance to new levels. 
And that that will also serve as well when we try to bring about and execute and actualize those wonderful, bold new, new initiatives uh, of, of innovation. So I think lean, when I think of it, is all of these things equally. Okay? Uh, here's some more things about what lean is. Uh, for sure, it is both people and process. It is a social and a technical system. And social, social technical theory uh, has been around for a long time. And it kind of goes off in the weeds sometimes, the way a lot of academic stuff does. But there's no doubt that there's a social mention to all this and technical. And, of course, in, 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 uh, in, in the, amongst the lean enterprise, the lean institutes, uh, there are 18 of us now, actually 18 uh, uh, different lean institutes in the world. I think uh, Norman Fall is here from, South Af- from Africa. Uh, Rene is here from uh, the Netherlands. I think Oreo is here from Spain. And we have a way of thinking about organizations in terms of pro- purpose. The organization has a purpose. Each piece of work has a purpose. And then there is a people dimension and a process dimension. And, and, and this is trying to indicate we'd like that to be in balance. So we often hear as you go around, one of the first things you'll, is a fundamental learning about lean, is that lean is very process focused. Lean is about process improvement, right? I, I know you've heard that for sure. And in fact, it's, it's true. We will absolutely obsess over process. I mean, listen to Dan for the last, the last hour, right? All these arcane things about how work takes place, how things occur. Um, and and uh, many of us, are, as we leave here today, some of us will be hitting the airport. And you are allowed to be frustrated when you get to the airport and you see all those cues, right? And in fact, you would like to get behind there and start helping to try to make the situation better. Dan mentioned I used to do some work with uh, Starbucks. And if you've ever been to a Starbucks, you probably, you may have been frustrated by the long queue. And it's okay that you want to get behind the counter and help them, help them make it better. Because lean thinking is about that. It's about being process focused. We just obsess over this stuff. Because that's where it becomes really fun. Lean is really fun. You start thinking about how the work is done. How can we make it better? Um, but it's sometimes what we do, though, is we start to copy the artifact that we see. And the, part, the process the most, is most important, really, is there's a process for creating processes, <laughs> right? For how we go about actually creating the processes we see. And there's a process for developing people, and it's all through getting people engaged in root cause thinking. Absolutely, going back to the PDSA, which, uh, which uh, Dan referred to. Lean thinking is going through understanding the causality, never jumping to conclusions. This is something that uh, is part and parcel of lean. It means, rather, they jump to conclusions to go through science. So this is the famous uh, Deming uh, wheel, we call it, a PDSA. By the way, in, here, here in the UK, do you mostly call it PDCA or PDSA? Who says PDCA? By the way, Deming, so De, that's the Deming model, right? Deming never once said PDCA. Isn't that funny? So here we, here we are. <laughs> poor poor, poor uh, man has passed away. There's nothing he can do about it. He hated when people said PDCA. He didn't like the nuance of the word check. And, and neither, neither, neither have I for a long time. So I've been trying to kind of break myself of saying PDCA. Anyway, plan do. So we have a, he need a, the plan needs to have some kind of hypothesis that we're going to there, then try out in the real world. And then we're going to check. We're going to study. We're going to reflect. We're going to ask what happened when I ran my little trial, Right? And then I'm going to make adjustments according to what I found out. And there should really almost always be some adjustment because usually you're going to learn something once you take your hypothesis, your theory, and you try it in the real world, right? It never goes according to plan. So therefore, you should make some adjustment. So I uh, should always have a P. You can't do PDCA without the P, <laughs> right? There needs to be a plan. And the adjust is never abandoned. It's never PDCA abandoned. And uh, often that's what we see. So... So that's science, right? We're trying to bring science into work, which is, not the scienti- which is not scientific management. Scientific management, you know, of Frederick Taylor and all that back 100 years ago, just exactly 100 years ago, really. That was where you had some smart people, some experts sitting there in that room, dreaming up the one best way, and then I'm going to impose that on the entire organization, right? It was not very scientific, really, what we call science. But we want science in the minds of everyone all the time. But here's the other side of that, which is that science will give us a good technical answer, right? A mechanical answer, how the work should be done. How those Starbucks baristas really should be doing that work so that the queue gets, gets shorter and shorter. How the people at the airport should do the work so that my bag doesn't get lost again. 
There'll be a good technical answer there, but you know, anyone who's worked in an organization of any size, and I would say even anything over five people, being technically right is just half the battle, right? And it's really the easy half of the battle, probably, because lean is also, and we also, I'm sure you've all heard this or said this yourself, lean is people-focused. Absolutely true. Um, and there's some basic uh, principles of what people focus means is the very famous lean principle of respect people uh, begins with that. But one of the reasons we respect people is not just because it's a good, humane thing to do. It's because it makes sense. It's because we'd better respect people because, you know what, we have to rely on people. I mean, unless you're the one who actually puts the engineering drawing on the, on the blueprint, unless you're the one who actually attaches the part to the vehicle, and you're at, unless you're the one actually do, closing the sale today, then we're relying on other people to do the work. We're relying on people out there to do the actual value-creating work, right? So we have, to rely, we have to rely on people. Therefore, it only makes perfect sense to develop people. It only makes logical business sense, therefore, to develop people. Um, as we used to say uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in Toyota and elsewhere, I think, really, before we make product, we make people. And developing people, respecting people, and being people-focused does not just mean kind of the soft, touchy-feely sort of uh, organization. We're going to be very challenging. So the fact that I'm respecting people, elevating the status of people in the organization, doesn't mean I'm going to be soft, per se. I'm going to actually be pretty darn tough. I'm going to be challenging you as I challenge myself uh, to get better. And unfortunately, this is often what we see, is we don't see these two things in balance. That's why I kind of like to use this scale here. I guess when Lean first started kind of becoming globally famous, even before, the, even before Dan and, and, and Jim came up with the word Lean, one of the first things we saw as we looked at Toyota systems was uh, a lot of the teamwork, the people working as teams. And that led a lot of the movement to kind of go in a very sort of a touchy-feely way. So uh, no decisions made unless everyone is consulting, consulted, and it's sort of a democratic process. So you still see, I've seen many, many, many lean implementations trans over the years, which is just so uh, people-focused. But then you also see many that are just very, very process-focused, so kind of the techie. Um, recently, I visited a, a company in Silicon Valley in, in California, and every single person in the company is an engineer. The finance people are engineers. The HR people are engineers. It's amazing, just absolutely amazing. Talk about a techie company. So when I showed this slide, they just started laughing. <laughs> they all started saying, yeah, we're real touchy-feely, right? <laughs> and so it, and the thing is, over time, we kind of go back and forth. We, you know, we kind of go back and forth. It ends up looking like this, I think. You know, maybe, maybe you can relate to this. And, of course, getting it in balance is what we want. And I don't know that anyone ever gets it perfectly in balance. But wanting to do that, having that as an aim, as an aspiration, I think is an, an important guide for us. You know, I don't really, I think on a good day, Toyota does a really good job of this. This is maybe one of the things that they do well, is, is having those in a nice balance. But only on a good day. Um, if, if, if they're a reference model, Dan, I mean, they're, far, they're a very imperfect reference model, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for sure. But if we think then about how we can, you know, get those things in balance. So here, here's a, a couple of things I can share of, of, of thoughts. Still kind of thinking about the fundamentals of what lean is, really. And, and, and now we'll start to also transla- transfer into that next question that, that Dan gave me of how to embed it uh, in, in, in practice. Um, <clears throat> when I arrived in, uh, I used to work for Toyota in Japan, uh, starting 1983 for five years. Uh, and when I got there, there, there wasn't very much that was written uh, in English and even not that much in Japanese. We used a lot of these cartoon illustrations like this. Um, so I would be shown an illustration like this and then, uh, you know, we'd talk about it and go do something <laughs> to try to understand and, and, learn, and learn the principle. Uh, this one, uh, I think, is, is, is always one of my favorites. And what it's trying to illustrate is what you can see is some people climbing up a, a mountain to get to, the, you know, to get to the peak of ultimate improvement, ultimate Kaizen. <laughs> it was kind of the image that we're trying to get at here. And you see the leader of this, uh, this troop that's going up the, the mountainside turned around, has a rope, because you can see the people following along there have sweat kind of pouring off, you know, because they're struggling, struggling to be able to climb up the hill, climb up the mountain. And so the leader recognizes that he needs to do two things at the same time. Get to the top of the hill, right, or, or to keep going, keep going, continuing the journey. 
He wants to, he needs to get the work done and develop people at the same time. Not as two separate things, but at the same time. And if you think back to this desire, it starts to get kind of interesting. How we can do those things at the, at the same time. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, this is kind of my, I don't know, set of three um, things that capture the lean leader's challenge. This is just something I made up. I don't know, you, you can... You can disagree, you can have your own version. But I think the first thing that a lean leader needs to do is to get each person to take initiative to solve problems and improve his or her work. That's first of all. So if you all work for me, or if we all work, all work in the same company, if every single person is doing this, that's a fantastic thing. Everybody's taking initiative to solve problems and improve our own piece of work, right? Number one. And number two, then, number two, Then we need to make sure that each person's job, each person's work, is aligned to provide value for the customer and prosperity for the company. So you're all out there, we're all out there, you know, improving our work, solving problems, and we're ensuring then that it's aligned for the customer to provide value. Right? So that's it. That's actually all we have to do. (laughs) It's as simple as that. Just those two things. Do those two things and we're golden, right? And to do that, I think uh, we have to begin with ourselves. You have to begin with yourself to begin getting that accomplished. And so there's been a lot of discussion of lean management, lean leadership. Uh, there's a lot written about it, a lot said about it. And I just wanted to make this quick observation, um, which is that lean leadership and lean management is obviously different from the old command and control dictator. And over the last couple of days, we've heard that mentioned many times, that command and control doesn't work, command and control doesn't work. And, and certainly command and control is thoroughly discredited. Right? I mean, in, in book after book and academic course after academic course, we all know it doesn't work exactly. But I'll, be, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm going to make a, uh, an observation. I haven't actually seen a good alternative offered other than to say that command and control is bad. And then we have some set of vague notions of how things could have, you could have distributed decision making that's somehow better, but it's, it's, it all kind of stays in a very vague world, at, at least in my view. But, and, it, and it comes up and it then becomes described in some sort of a notion of an enlightened modern manager who gives people objectives and says, you know, now you're the owner, you're empowered, now please go do that, and I don't even care how you do it, as long as you get it done, you're the owner of it. Well, the, the, the lean leadership that I've ex- experienced, whether it was uh, back in Toyota on a good day or, or wherever, is, it's, it's neither of these. It's equally different from that commonly accepted notion of the enlightened modern manager. And although you can see from a drive-by in one day that it's not command and control, I mean, if you go into a good, lean operation, you'll see people out there clearly making decisions, solving problems on their own volition, on their own initiative. Clearly, there's not command and control exactly going on there. But it, you have to kind of stick around a little bit longer and, and, and peel back some layers to see that it's also not just a matter of just turning everyone loose uh, and saying, okay, now, you, now you're empowered. Here, here's your objectives. I don't care how you do it. The, the lean... The good lean mentors I've had would never say, never say, I don't care how you do it. I desperately want to hear how you you plan to do it. Because my job is to mentor you to another level. And for me to do that, I need to understand your thinking. I need to hear your thinking. So I never just step back and and have a laissez-faire approach. Not telling someone what to do with command and control doesn't mean just abandonment. It doesn't mean I won't roll up my sleeves with you and think about what the situation is. So let's just explore that just a little bit. Time's a little bit short today. Um, I have uh, two words up there, responsibility and authority. And the reason I put them up there is because we usually try to think of those two things as coming together in a nice, tight ball. Uh, we write about that in books. We teach about that in business schools. In business school, we'll say never give your subordinate the responsibility for something without also giving them the authority for it. And in fact, no one likes to have responsibility for something when you don't have authority, when you're, when you're not authorized to make decisions. I understand that. It's, it is very uncomfortable. However, what we've done is made a very simplistic leap to maintaining that these are, can be one and the same thing. They're two very different things. And you have to think of them differently. And what we usually do in companies is spend all our time and energy focus, focusing on the authority, the authorization side, which just leads to debate and fights and territorialism, as opposed to the responsibility side. Okay? So, to give you a quick, and I'm sorry time is so short. But I, so I worked in Toyota City for five years. 
Uh, when I arrived there in 1983, I was the only uh, non-Japanese there. So it was me and 70,000 Japanese. Uh, I, spoke a little bit, I spoke a little bit of Japanese language. And uh, my job was to help Toyota figure out for the first time how to transfer its production and management system overseas in a holistic fashion, in a holistic fashion. So I was there for five years trying to do that. And in that five years, almost never was I given a solution. Almost never. Almost never. The funny thing is, it took me three years to notice that. <laughs> Strange as that sounds, it took me three, it, it, this is absolutely true, it took me three years to notice at the same time, I wasn't free to just do what I wanted. And after about the, th- the, th- the three-year point, I-, I noticed this. I said, well, this is strange. <laughs> no one's really telling me what to do, but, it's not, but I'm not free to just do what I want to. So it's not bottom-up, which is kind of what I thought was going to happen when I, before I went there. But it wasn't really top-down either. I said, well, this is very curious. I laid awake at night trying to figure this out. Well, how does this work? So I finally went to my boss one day at the, about the three-year point, and he said something to me, which I think is an absolute human truism. I think it has nothing to do with Japan, nothing to do with Toyota. He said, when, he said uh, after a long, uh, torturous conversation <laughs> of him using the Socratic method and me trying to work through what he was trying to teach me, uh, he said, John, whenever you tell someone what to do, you take the responsibility for that action away from them. And I think that has to be absolutely true. Now, I know there's a yeah, but there, right? So so I'm not saying go back to work tomorrow and stop telling people what to do. It's not what I'm saying at all. But I'm saying there's a dynamic here that's often kind of hidden and and, and and undiscussed. It goes without being discussed. But it's absolutely true. When you tell someone what to do, you take the responsibility, the ownership away from them. And yet, at work, is it not true that we want people to take initiative, to take ownership, to take responsibility? And if we could just get people to do that, things are going to start getting better, right? Starting right away. And yet the way we manage, the way we structure ourselves, the way we manage works against that every single moment of every day is what I'm going to suggest. Or that's my hypothesis for you. That's one of the things I think I learned. But here's what I was given. Clear responsibility to propose solutions to problems I owned. I wasn't free to do what I wanted at all. Okay? I had a, when I arrived there, I was given a problem, a blank sheet of paper, and a mentor assigned to me. <laughs> And I was able to propose things of what, of what I thought should take place to make a situation better. And as I was able to propose better and better, I was able to generate more and more of my authorization. That made me the entrepreneurial owner of problems that I owned. And again, time is a bit of... <clears throat> so this, and this, this is something I think that we can do if we want to do it, and then we practice it. So what I'm suggesting further is that this way of managing is revolutionary. So if, if what we know about the Toyota production system or lean production uh, is revolutionary, this is an absolute revolution for, for management. This way of managing provides extraordinary focus, direction, or control. Right? I'm working with my mentor who's giving me questions, who's guiding me so I don't go, go off the rails too much. At the same time, maximum flexibility because no one's telling anyone exactly what to do. So for any problem that I have, I can pursue my own. I can pursue all sorts of solutions that I want to pursue. Okay? So I'm suggesting that this way of working can resolve the age-old dilemma that encumbers all large organizations. And by large organization, I think I mean anything over five people. Of control versus flexibility, direction versus adaptability. So. I'm going to also maybe slightly oversimplify, but I don't think it's actually, I'll, I'll take that back. I don't think it's an oversimplification. All organizational theory is built around answering one very simple dilemma, which is, so if there are 200 people here now, you can't have one person telling 200 people what to do when, or one person telling 1,000 people what to do when, right? Obviously. But neither can you have a thousand people doing what they want when they want to. This is the challenge. I mean, that's it. I mean, that's it. We write tremendous books, you know, that that make that very complex. But that's the problem. And therefore, we organize ourselves in different ways, hierarchically, with line item authority, you know. And then we come up with the matrix. We do all these different things to try to to, to try to deal with that. And I'm suggesting the way this way of working, the organic dynamics involved in this way of managing people makes the dilemma melt away. You get the control and the direction, but you get the flexibility. You get direction and adaptability. 
both at the same time. By the way, we are managing people at the DNA level. If we can do it, if we can pull this off, and I'm suggesting that we can indeed pull this off, that we can do it. So that's an incredible thing right there, right? I believe. So let's go back to this little graphic and this, this point here. So we're going to develop people through getting the work done. Not, I said before, develop people, get the job done at the same time. So now I'm taking that even a step further. I'm going to develop people through getting the work done. Okay. So Dan mentioned, um, uh, be, uh, had some uh, enlightened discussion for us about learning. And I think that's absolutely at, 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 at the core of what we're talking about. So what do we know about how people learn? And there's a lot more that we, we, we're, we're learning now about how people learn. But a couple of basic things I think we could agree on are that we can get conceptual understanding through things like books, lectures like this, and discussions and stuff like that, right? Seminars. But behavioral change comes through experience, through making mistakes, through experimentation and trial and error. I mean, I think that's true, and at least uh, that's my hypothesis uh, for you today. So bear with me uh, to, to, uh, for, for now. So I'm going to suggest that the lean enterprise is the ultimate social technical system. So that the process of doing the work is integrated with the process of improving the work. Not two separate things. People say, how many times do people say, I don't have time to improve? <laughs> right? I'm just trying to make it through the day. Well, we have to integrate those so they become one of the same. And this is even maybe more, more, uh, more incredible, which is the operating processes are the people development processes. And we'll have training, we'll have lectures, but we're going to design the operating processes, the way the work takes place, so that it develops people as they're doing their job, as they're doing their work. Here's a quick photograph for you. Um, this is from uh, uh, Adelaide, Australia, uh, a hospital called Flinders. And you can see what's going on here, which is uh, you have a woman there, who's a lady there who's a nurse, and she is holding a construction vest. And I think you can't read it in the back. But I'll read it for you. It says, medication round, please don't interrupt. Medication round, please don't interrupt. As it turned out, before this, uh, this uh, vest uh, was, was, uh, was developed for, for her, with and for her, uh, the folks there at Flinders had uh, done a, taken a video and videotaped this nurse for 40 minutes. And at the 37th minute, she administered some medication at the 37th minute. So then after she finished her work, everyone sat down and to debrief over what, uh, over, to take a look at the video. As it turned out, she'd been trying to administer that medication for the entire 37 minutes. <laughs> and couldn't do it because she kept getting interrupted. Now, how does that relate to this? This is an example of uh, how we're going to combine doing the work, improving the work, and developing people as problem solvers all at the same time. So... Um, Forgive me for using a car automobile assembly line, for example, but it's something that I know. It's just a great example to show. Um, what you see here is a car. See someone who has a work cycle that starts right here, and then their job takes 60 seconds. And by the way, most cars, most car assembly lines in the world, the, in the world, the, the, the work takes about 60 seconds. That's the pace that most uh, most of them run, just about. Um, and you can see it divided uh, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, so you can see kind of the pace of how the work is taking place. And I think you know what's up there in the middle and the top, right? Which is an andon. And you see what the, work, the worker has a furrowed brow there. Trying, the worker's trying to do, their, do uh, his or her work. Um, and the furrowed brow indicates the worker's having a problem. And the worker then, because of having a problem, pulls the rope, the signal cord. Uh, and in, upon pulling the rope, that lights up uh, an andon, the, 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 the light there, station number three. Probably some bells and whistles or music plays at the same time. The team leader who's nearby then sees that and comes to help. So what you have here is a beautifully designed social and technical system. There, there's a lot of technical design here that we don't have enough time to go into today. Uh, but exactly how long the job should take. In, in, a, in a 60 seconds, the work is probably doing about between 10 and 15 different operations, 10 or 15 different things. And I think you also know that when the worker pulls the rope, the light lights up, but the line doesn't stop right away. The line keeps going. The team leader comes, so therefore it's a social system. Team leader comes to help. Team leader comes and looks. If the team leader can help, 
If they together can solve the problem right away, the team leader will pull the rope again, which resets it, and it never stops. But they'll keep working to solve the problem until it reaches the end of the station. And if they can't solve it, the line stops. The whole line stops. Beautiful social technical system here. A lot of thought and in design into the, both the technical aspects and the social aspects because that means when I pull the rope, someone has to, the team leader has to come and help within the job cycle. And a factory like this is going to have probably 2,000 or so workers. So someone is going to come help within the job cycle. Now, I can't tell you how many companies I've known that have tried to copy this system. And what they'll copy is the artifacts, what you can see there, right? It's been a lot of money. I can't tell you how, I've seen companies spend thousands of dollars on these Andon boards and put the rope in place. Uh, and then you go in and, 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 you, and you see all the light going on all the time. You go back about a year later, it's all turned off. <laughs> they, were, they were imposing this process, okay, without understanding the people, the social dimension. So how does that relate to this lady here? Medication round, please do not interrupt. So there are two, two or three reasons of why we don't want to interrupt. Okay? Two basic reasons. Who would like to shout out what they are? Wrong drugs, wrong time. Excuse me? Wrong drugs, wrong time. Wrong drug, wrong time. Wrong drug, wrong time. Okay, and what does that mean for, for, uh, for uh, what does that mean? So, if I interrupt, the chances of an error are greater. So, if I interrupt, she can't continue with her work. So, it took 37 minutes just to do one medication. It turns out that's exactly what's taking place here. When people make mistakes, as it turns out, this is after they've been, when they've been interrupted. So, I mentioned before, there are 2,000 people. That are, building, that are building cars in this factory. And I also mentioned that there's a tremendous technical design here. Well, it turns out that every single job on this line is choreographed to begin and end at exactly the same time. So if I pull the rope and it stops the line right there, what's going to happen? I'm going to interrupt the work of 2,000 people. So, gee, I'm sitting here working and all of a sudden uh, Dan had a problem. He pulled the rope. It stopped. I was in the middle of operation number six out of my 12. And, oh, now all of a sudden the line started moving again. Oh, wait a minute. Was I, did I finish number six or was I working on number seven? <laughs> now, out of the 2,000 people, probably nine, one, 1,999 will remember and get it right. But one of them uh, won't. And this is something that can be very easily empirically shown, right? And as it turns out, medication errors, I guess, do occur. I don't know. Eric, do you have any? Not in, not in, not in any of the hospitals of the people who are here, but... I have heard that in some hospitals in the United States, it's been known to happen. It's been known to happen. Uh, 300,000 or something is a number that I hear. Um, um, also, I don't know in the U.S., again, it, not in the University of Michigan or Beth Israel or others, but I, I understand that there's a, even a wrong side surgery every single day, maybe even two or so every day. Can you imagine anything worse than a wrong side surgery? Oh, my goodness. It happens, uh, I understand, once or twice a day. So please do not interrupt. I don't know, in engineering work, a lot of engineers here. You know, you ever do your engineering work, someone comes up and interrupts you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then what happens? You know, finally you get to turn back to your work and then you say, oh, where was I now, right? Your mind has to change. Your mind doesn't do SMED quite as well as machines do. So what's happening now is that t- here's what actually is uh, happening, is these four things. And these four things you can do anywhere. First of all, I'm going to design the work so that I'm going to make success understandable and doable. So let's see, are all my jobs back, back at home, are they all designed so that success is understandable and doable? That means designing a worker-friendly process and provide training. Then I'm going to make it easy to see problems. What is it? I'm going to define what a problem is, which is anything that gets in the way of successful completion of the work, and I'm going to make it clear what to do when a problem is encountered, which is to contain and notify. Then I'll make it clear what will happen after notifying, which is someone will come help you within your cycle of work, 
and you will participate in root cause problem solving. These things comprise the design of work that develops people as they do the work into, becoming, into being good problem solvers without taking responsibility and ownership of their work away from them. And this you can do anywhere. That's exactly what had happened here. And by the way, if some hint from this may have come from, uh, from, from, the, from the industrial world, this photograph is from a factory, a GE factory in the U.S. That's, that, <laughs> that visited a hospital in the U.S., and saw this taking place, and then they took it back to their factory, and they're doing the same thing now. (laughs) So the cross-learning that takes place here the last couple of days is wonderful to see. Standard work area, do not disturb people in yellow vest. That's a GE factory in Kentucky. So do not interrupt while I'm running this play. This enables me to perform with less chance of error. It It enables me to get the work done so I can produce cars. And we can do PDSA by identifying normal from abnormal. That gives me some chance then at balancing the people in process, fulfilling my role as a manager, which I think is to enable that to happen, based on a purpose, and that purpose being to provide value for the customer, prosperity for the company, and to do it in a way that fulfills and makes uh, fulfilling jobs for all the people that are, doing, that are doing their work. So with that, Dan, I guess that's a, a look anyway at... Um, at how we can embed the practice of lean uh, into work by the way we do our jobs as managers.